All right, next up, um, King David. Thanks for coming, King David. What qualifies you to be our next small group leader? <clears throat> well, what was that word you used uh, before my name? Uh, King? Yeah, King, right. How many of those am I up against? My strengths, uh, plagues. I'm pretty good with the staff. Can't decide who gets the last brownie? Cut it in two. Boom. Wisdom. Um, parting large bodies of water. Desert survival skills. Weaknesses. <laughs> Weaknesses. Mountain climbing. Um, commandment retrieval. Does that look weak to you? And I can make a pretty mean goat sausage. Okay, I mean, maybe haircuts. Women. Whose isn't? <laughs> So I lied. I said my wife was my sister. They were gonna kill me. <laughs> Why are we even getting into this? I'm just not sure we're comfortable with you in a leadership position. Look, it, it, Jesus Christ himself called you Satan. He was trying to make a point. Get thee behind me, Satan, I believe is the exact quote. Bathsheba, I knew you were gonna go there. It was a rock to the back of the head. I really regret that it happened. And that's when you slept with the maid? My wife said she was fine with it. Abraham. What? Come on. Okay, timeline. Um, first I slept with his wife. No, 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 no. I didn't kill Christians. Then I lied to him. I was just watching people's coats. Then I had him killed, okay? They killed Christians. It's a long time ago. Besides, that was a different guy. That was Saul. <laughs> I've ever killed anyone. What? You got somebody giving you beef? Huh? You need something taken care of? Where's the app? Yo, bring it, huh? Didn't you deny Christ three times? No. Nah, I'm pretty sure you did. No. Yeah, I'm almost positive. Uh, no. Okay, I did. No, I've never killed anyone. Why would you even ask that question? This is the guy. Hold on, I, I mean, I do have some questions about my qualifications. I've never been to seminary. Oh, you'll do fine. I really don't have a whole lot of experience. Do you love God? Yeah. Do you want to help people? Sure. Do you have a harem? No, I don't have a harem. <laughs> All right, we're good then. Thank you. Well, let, me, let me think about this first. <laughs> oh, 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 got her. Oh, wait a second. Look who has them. Still got the tablets. So they're interviewing for leaders for their small groups. And they're going through all the leaders of the Bible and all their, the, the rough starts they all have, Moses murdering someone, etc. And uh, usually the one, if you want to pick, uh, last time we were here, two weeks ago, I said we we're going to be looking at Paul today. Because usually if you want to pick one person to focus on when it comes to having a rough start in, in, in their work, a rough, rough beginning, it's Paul. Because he's the guy who takes this amazing education, amazing family background, and he starts out by supervising a, a, an angry crowd that stones Stephen, uh, stones uh, the first guy who dies for uh, following Jesus. And, and so usually, I've heard sermons on Paul before and how he can be turned around and, and maybe we, he has a rough start and so can we. But then I uh, was reminded of another person in the Bible. Uh, I was reading a book, can you throw the cover up there? Uh, a book by a, a Reverend Jason McKelly, I guess is how you pronounce his name, 104 Skins Wrestling with the Random Bits of the Bible. You can get it on Kindle for about two bucks. Great read. It's very short, like 48 pages. And uh, he has a few pages where he talks about a story that is even more outlandish than Paul. He tells the story of Elisha and how Elisha uses the bears. And I thought, that, that's even better. We, we, need to, we need to look at Elisha, because Paul supervises someone being killed. Elisha is directly responsible for 42 teens being mauled. That's a story we need to spend some time with. So we're going to look at Elisha today. He is the successor to the confusedly named prophet Elijah. So Elijah is the first, then Elisha is the one who follows him. So Elijah is um, 
he is the one who, who we are told he is the forerunner of the Messiah and so when John the Baptist is asked who are you they can say I am Elijah I, I'm the one who comes to prepare the way of the Lord and, and so Elijah is the one um, when Jesus is going towards Jerusalem towards what we now call Holy Week and Easter he, st he climbs a mountain and in the glory that happens there what we call the transfiguration it's Moses and Elijah who show up so Elijah is one of the most important people in the the Old Testament. He is the, the, pro, the, the, the prototype of all other prophets. And he, when he knows his days are about up, he trains a successor, Elisha. And Elisha follows Elijah to the point where Elijah, is, he is assumed into heaven. One of two people in the Bible who goes straight to heaven. Um, and uh, so Elijah goes off to heaven, but before he le goes, he, he leaves the, the mantle of the prophets to uh, Elisha. And the mantle had been something like this, uh, something worn to mark one as a servant of God. And uh, so Elisha is now, he has the position, he has the authority of Elijah. And he's going back home and he's going to start leading the nation, start being the prophet over all of the northern kingdom of Israel. And what we read right there in that little two snippet verse was what happens first. He's on his way home. And as he's on his way home, a group of young teens come out of the woods and mock him. Go up bald head, is what they insult him with. They mock him, go up bald head, and he responds by cursing them. And two she-bears come out of the woods and maul 42 of them. First thing he does. Okay. Isn't, you know, if we're looking through the Bible for examples of leadership and we're looking for people who are patient and wise, gentle, responsible, uh, this isn't it, right? This is not, uh, this is mean and vindictive and cruel is what this is. And, and so it, it's a rough start. Paul has a rough start to his ministry. I think Elisha has got him beat hands down when it comes to bad beginnings. And so how do we understand this bad beginning? How do we make sense of it? There, there's one way we can, we can just read it straight and say, you know what, you mess with God, this is what you got coming to you. you know, if you, mess, you, you touch the Ark of the Covenant, you're going to die. And, and just like, you, that's disrespecting the Word of God written on the tablets in the Ark. This, this is people disrespecting the prophet who is, is, speaks the Word of God. And you mess with him, you're going to die, that's it. Word of God for us, the people of God, move on. Right? You just... But the problem with doing that is you have to keep a straight face and get over the sour taste in your mouth that it leaves to say that if you mess with someone, God's going to get you. I just don't think I can do that with a straight face. So um, I don't think that's a good way to, to read this. There's, there's another way to read, to understand what's going on here, that Elisha uh, calls out these bears to maul 42 youth. Uh, this, this is what I call the squirm approach to uh, reading the passage. You get really uncomfortable, so you kind of start squirming with it and say, well, maybe. Well, maybe if we look at it this way. Well, maybe if we bend it just right. So this is what you can do. You can say, and you notice how he's walking by Bethel. Uh, Bethel, or Bethel, this is where uh, when the nation of, of Israel was split into north and south, north Israel and south Judah. The, the temple was in southern, southern Judah. And, and so uh, the king of northern Israel didn't want his people going down to the temple in, the, in, the, in other, another nation. So he made two golden calves. And he put one of them at Bethel, and that's where people show up to worship. And so uh, Elisha is walking past Bethel. Bethel. And uh, these people who are coming out to mock him, if they're teens, maybe they're uh, priests in training. And so maybe they're mocking him. And they're called, called, saying, go up. That's exactly what they're saying. Go up, bald head. And Elijah had just gone up to heaven. And so he is being told to go up. And, and, and so they're telling him he should go die, basically. And calling him bald. You know, maybe you can say... Uh, 
that the, the mantle he was wearing would have been made of, of hair, right? Woven hair of some sort. And so calling him bald is not a reference to his head. It's a reference to the hair woven thing he's wearing. And so he's calling him bald is implying that he's not worthy to wear it and like he's filched it off of Elijah's corpse or something. And, and so maybe if you squirm and look at it just right, you can look at it like that. And maybe he's, can, he's, he's just doing what his predecessor did. Elijah took on the four 150 prophets of Baal who followed Queen Jezebel and now he is just doing the same thing. He's taking on these 42 young priests who are also idolatrous. Maybe. You, know, you can actually push this, this farther, right? You can point out things like he had uh, parted waters on his way to get to Bethel. He had taken the mantle off and hit the waters of a stream and it parted, just like Moses. And just like Moses, now he is uh, in this conflict with people who are worshipping a golden calf, just like Moses who comes down off the mountain and there's a golden calf. And so you can, you can kind of squirm with this. And, and try to make it feel good, and, and it, it, it's it's tempting, right? It's real tempting. It, it tries to. It's an embarrassing passage, and, and if we can't get rid of it, if we can't ignore it, if we can't just punt on it, um, at least we can try to make it feel comfortable. Well, maybe, but you know, I think you look at this, and, and it just it, it's hard for us to say that God would call someone to be a prophet that was this mean and vindictive and was this much of a jerk, basically. This guy is a jerk, right? And, and so we don't want him to be this mean. We don't want him to be this much of a jerk because we, we want to say that someone who is this messed up obviously can't be a prophet. Do not pass go. Do not pa collect $200. Just get out of here, right? That's what we want to be able to say. That, that's the second way to sort of read this, to try to squirm and make ourselves comfortable with it. Well, if we read it and just understand what's happening, and, and read the whole of the story, right? What we read, with, if we read the whole of the story of Elisha, is that he will go on to save a widow's son from death. He will go on to feed a multitude with 20 loaves. He will go on to heal a Syrian general from leprosy, to rescue people from slavery. He will go on to do amazing things in the name of God. But this is where he starts. And where he starts out is as a jerk. All right, he starts out as a jerk. He has this really rough start. And, and the fact that he is not immediately disqualified we have a term for what that is. We call it grace. Right? It is grace that he is still called. And, and I think this is a third way to read this passage. And I think it's probably the most honest and best way to read it. Not to try to make it a lesson about holiness. If you mess with God, God's going to get you. God just happened to use bears that time. It's not, a less, it's not something to squirm about and, and, and get really uncomfortable about and try to make nice and try to paper over and make just everything nice and comfortable again because it's not comfortable. The dude cursed a bunch of teens and they got mauled by bears. There's no way to sugarcoat that. No, I think the best we can do with a passage like this is to look at it in the entire life of Elisha and say that just like God called Moses who starts out as a murderer, just like God calls Peter, who denies Christ three times, just like God calls Paul, who begins by holding the coats while everyone else stones Stephen, God calls Elisha, who starts out as a mean, vindictive jerk, who can't take an insult, and calls out bears. Right? That, that's how he starts. He is not disqualified from leading, from making a difference, it is grace that he is still allowed to do so. God does not call perfect people to do perfect things. God calls messed up people to follow the one who is perfect. If you only read this one snippet from the life of Elijah, you think that this is it, this is the end, this is all he's ever good for. You just got to read the whole story and see. I've said it before, I believe it still. Every saint has a past. Every sinner has a future. Every saint has a past. Every sinner has a future. This is Elisha's past. Every saint has one. There's no one who is perfect. There's just people who appear perfect until you sit down to drink coffee with them and you find out. Everyone has a past. And everyone has a future, too. Right? So, let's look in the mirror for a minute and see how, what we really think about this with ourselves. Because to follow Jesus is first off to realize that there is 
a calling. We're supposed we, to follow Jesus is to realize we are called to live a certain way, right? To follow Jesus is to say that we are meant to live lives that are graceful and respectful and forgiving and reconciling, and we are called to live like that with others, right? We are called to be a people where anger is never used to hurt others, where families never are broken, where people are always forgiven and we always love our neighbors. That is how we are called to live. And is that how we live? And is that how we're surrounded? I mean, that's not right. We, that is not an accurate description of reality. And so we always live in this tension between where we're headed, the kingdom of God, where we all live uh, in the fullness of God's will, and where we are today. And we, all, we are always living in that tension where we hit these situations where we say, this is not right. This is not how it should be. This is not God's will. And, and then what happens? Right? What happens so often when you see a problem, you see a situation? How often have you looked in the mirror and said, that bothers me, but I can't do anything about it. I can't do anything about it because I'm not smart enough, I'm not patient enough, I'm not wise enough, I'm not experienced enough, I don't have uh, the credentials, no one would listen to me, I don't have the right temperament, I I've done things and no one would follow me. Y'all ever said that to yourselves? I, I have. I know I have. I can't get involved with that. No, no, I'm not, I'm not the right person, right? That's not me. Or, how often have we done the other, the other aspect of this where someone does dare to step up and try to help? And you say, you know what, I, small town, right? You, you see someone trying to make a difference, and what do you say? I know that person. I know what they were like back in high school. I know their family. I know how their kids turned out. I know what happened to their neighbors. I know how they did this or that or the other, right? And so what do you do? Are you willing to step up and follow someone? No, no, I'm not. They, they should not get involved. I know their past. I know how they've messed up, right? We have this experience where we either doubt ourselves whether we can step forward and make a difference in the name of Jesus, or we will doubt others whether they can make a difference because we know either our past or other people's past. But let me ask you a question. Has anyone here stoned anyone recently? Right? Anyone stoned anyone? Has anyone mauled 42 teenagers in the last week? If God can use people who have that rough of a start... You think God can use you? Right? If God can call people who begin by mauling 42 youth, God can call us. If God can use vindictive jerks, God can use me. Right? You ever think, you know, I have often thought, I don't have the temperament for this job. I don't think. Elisha had the temperament for his calling either. That doesn't mean he was a bad prophet. That just meant that it got a little bit dicey at times. And the Lord knows that my life has gotten dicey at times. So that doesn't mean I can't be a pastor. That just means life is interesting. <laughs> we are all called and we can all respond. I believe that we as a church are called to make a difference in each other's lives here and a difference in the world around us. And we are prepared to do so, but we have to believe that our past is not an anchor that drags drags us back. It's just a past. It's a rough start. We get over it. We move on. And we can do this because we have grace. We are offered grace. If we don't have grace, then we are a bunch of judgmental jerks who are ready to pounce on each other when anyone messes up. Without grace, we are just a horrible, horrible group of people who are going to beat each other up if anyone risks doing anything wrong. But with grace, this is the place where you can dare to say, that bothers me. I think God wants it to work differently. Let's see what we can do. Right? Let's see what we can do. We are all called to make a difference, not because we are perfect, but because we are, by grace, forgiven. And so I want to challenge you, next time you, you are bothered by a situation, next time you are bothered by the world around you, next time you see something that makes you think, that's not right, do something. Do something. You might have had a background, so what? You haven't mauled 42 youth lately. You can do something. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.